Hello and welcome to another Tech Distractions video. In this one we'll be taking a look at a low profile desktop with an interesting CPU from around 1993, the TX486 SLC from Texas Instruments. We'll take a look at its background, history and model types before putting well one through some benchmarks and games. Looking at the outside of the case we can see this one's had quite a bit of history. At the front we've got that familiar yellowing of the plastics and a single floppy disk drive. Overall the paintwork is well worn to say the least. I'm going to need a rust treat and repaint this one eventually. I will likely do this at the same time as retro brighting the front. Opening it up we can see a small 100 watt power supply and a 3.5 inch hard disk from Quantum, a 120 megabyte ProDrive LPS. There's a graphics adapter with the Chips and Technologies F82C452 chipset. This particular card is manufactured by Wong Labs and is labelled as a PCS 3050C3E4 and likely came out of a machine like the PC350-16, a 386 SX based computer Wong released in 1991. I'm assuming this card found its way here during some sort of part swap over the journey. It's a bit older than the rest of the system. It looks like we have 512 kilobytes of video memory based on 80 nanosecond fast page RAM from Toshiba. Here's a generic multi IO card that has a familiar layout with IDE, floppy, serial, parallel and a game port. It's got a label of SAB757L and based on the FCC ID appears to have been manufactured by a Taiwanese company called Forever Grand International. The motherboard is a 386SXA version 4 made by Lucky Star. This is a fairly common board layout with six 16-bit ISA slots. ALI or Acer Labs Incorporated M1217 chipset is on board and this is a very highly integrated chipset for the 386SX bus. There's four 1MB 30-pin SIMs totaling 4MB of RAM. The CPU is an embedded TX486 SLC-E at 33MHz made by Texas Instruments. It and the related 386SX bus are the focus of this video and there's a little bit of a story behind it. In 1988, Intel released the 386SX or Single Word External which was a 32-bit internal part with a 16-bit external bus. This was targeted at the low-end market. 386 and 386DX, or Double Word External, had the 32-bit external bus and at the time was the high-end performance part. Both chips required a matching 387-based coprocessor for floating point functions. During this time, AMD had created its own version, the AM386. However, it was locked in a lengthy legal dispute with Intel and this delayed its release until 1991. Also in 1991, IBM licensed the 386SX core and created the 386 SLC with 8 kilobytes of level 1 cache. The license only allowed IBM to sell these CPUs integrated with the system and not for the general DIY market. In May 1992, after a few years manufacturing coprocessors for the 286 and 386, Cyrix created the CX486 SLC, its launch CPU product. It is not related to the one from IBM. It claimed to have a 486 compatible instruction set, 1 kilobyte of cache, and shoehorned onto the existing 386 SX bus. The chip was sold as a quad flat package designed to be soldered in place on the desktop and laptop motherboards. It was a similar product for the 386DX platform, the CX486 DLC, but this is a topic for another video. Cyrix used SGS Thompson to fab the chip as they already had a license agreement with Intel, and this caused Intel to do what Intel did, and sue, claiming the license that SGS Thompson had was not allowed to be extended for resale. But fortunately for Cyrix and Texas Instruments, who also joined in the fun, and was also an Intel licensee at the time, eventually won the case a few years later in court. And unlike AMD, Cyrix didn't have to wait for the decision to sell their product. Cyrix's release into the market caused an immediate impact. Intel's stock price dropped all of a sudden and it had two new competitors in the CPU market, Texas Instruments and Cyrix, who was founded by XTI executives. To remain competitive in the space, Intel also dropped the price on its 486SX CPU from 282 to 119 US dollars. Here's an advertisement from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram from December 1993. The 486 SLC33 is sold here as a complete system for 597 US dollars without any multimedia or software except for the MS-DOS 6. A cheap entry for someone wanting it for home use, work or study. Then you could step up to the multimedia version with Windows 3.1 that came with a larger hard disk, more RAM, a CD-ROM, sound card and even some of those little speakers we all know and love. I reckon most of you watching will be looking at the DX2 and thinking this is what you would have chosen out of this list. Yep, it's significantly faster. It has a Visa local bus for faster graphics and I.O. performance. But this configuration lacks multimedia options and you'd need to shell out the other four or five hundred dollars on top at the time. And this is where the 486 SLC shines, the total price. This sort of thing extended to the notebook market as well. The generic 486 SLC is almost six hundred dollars cheaper here than the Packard Bell 486 SL and I reckon the Cyrix chip might be a little faster in some tasks too. 
Also from the US, Salt Lake Tribune, February 1994, this outlet was selling a 486SX25 system, without multimedia it seems, for $1,265. I'm a little more interested in the ad underneath. You could upgrade your old XT or 286 to the 486SLC33 for $399. I know there's a 2 megabyte difference of RAM between the two choices, and possibly there's another bundled component with the XT deal to make it more compatible. If you've got any ideas on this, I'd love to hear them down in the comments below. There were some more iterations of the 486 SLC family. During 1993, the CX486SLC2-50 was released, and this was a clock-doubled 5-volt version. TI released their own branded version of the 486SLC-E and the 486SLC-E-V, which dropped down to 3 volts. The 486SLC-E is the model a chip we'll be looking at today. It contained the same 1KB of cache as the Cyrix version, and this one also runs at 33MHz. As mentioned earlier, these chips were usually soldered and not designed to be replaced by the end user. For the DIY market, there were some examples of clip-on upgrade packages, like this one from Evergreen Technologies, the 486 Superchip, or Cyrix's own clip-on 386-486 upgrade. These were also directly soldered to a board, but the board was designed to clip over the top of an existing CPU on the motherboard. It was an interesting option for the budget-conscious consumer who couldn't afford going with something like a 486DX upgrade combo. You could squeeze a bit more life out of the 386SX platform and get a little bit more performance out of Windows 3X. IBM iterated its earlier chip to the 486SLC and SLC2, again, not comparable to the Cyrix version, with 16 kilobytes of cache. It was notably faster than the Cyrix and TI versions, and it went on to release a fully 32-bit Blue Lightning version, which is more like a maxed out 386DX rather than the SLC, so again it's out of scope for this video. TI released the TI486SXLC family of chips, which were minor modifications to the Cyrix 486SLC versions, including 8KB of cache instead of Cyrix's 1KB, and it supported clock doubling for higher frequencies. Cyrix and TI had compelling offerings for OEMs like HP and Twinhead, who could just slot these into existing designs for the 386 platform. So with the backstory out of the way, it's on to the remainder of the build. The last piece is my own addition, a little sound card from Expert Media. I got this one off fellow YouTuber, the Soundcard Database. It is based on the Opti 931 chipset, and I recently made up a little 3D printed bracket for it. I figured it would be an interesting one to put into this build as these sorts of cards don't tend to get a lot of love from the retro scene. The 931 was released around 1996 and had a very low price and limited shelf life. Opti had intended the 931 to end up as an integrated audio chipset for motherboards, but this wasn't a popular implementation with AC97 starting to really kick off. The 931 could operate in both Windows Sound System and Sound Blaster Pro modes. Compatibility with DOS gaming is pretty good, however the FM is not a genuine OPL3. It is Opti's own implementation called OptiFM, so it'll be interesting to hear how it goes with things like MIDI and game music. Ok, so let's get some cables connected and get this thing booted up. Starting out with a VGA cable which goes to the LCD and the Scalar Capture device. I've got a PS2 keyboard adapter, power cable, keyboard, audio cable for the capture, and a serial mouse. That's about it, let's power it on and see what we've got here. The video bias for the one graphics card shows up and I reckon it's got a nice font. We've got the 4 megabytes of RAM, and after boot we get to the Opti testing and config program. The Sound Blaster Pro mode is active and has put the sound card on IRQ5. I find this works well for a majority of DOS games. This card plays nicely with Unisound 2 if that's your preferred option. Checking out some DOS benchmarks now, and starting with 3D Bench 1.0 for slower PCs, we get a score of 14.9. 1.0C for faster PCs, we get 14.7. PC Player gets 3.9 frames per second. Doom for slower PCs gets 3139 real ticks or 23.8 frames per second. We get 12067 for the faster PC benchmark or 6.2 frames per second. Ouch. According to System Information 8, we get an overall benchmark score of 41.3, putting it between a 386DX33 and a 486DX33. NSSI gives us a score of 10,703 dry stones per second for the CPU, putting it between a 386DX33 and a 386DX40. For floating point, it gives us 3,144 kilowatt stones per second. The 1 kilobyte of cache is enabled by default on this CPU, and when we run top bench, we get a score of 72, putting it near a 386DX40. If I take the turbo jumper off, it drops down to 33, and this puts us near a 16 MHz 286. The 
Disabling the cache and rerunning, we now get 63, putting it closer to a 386SX33, which makes sense, I guess. Taking the turbo jumper off with the cache disabled, we drop down to 26, and this is closer to a 12.5 MHz 286. Similar to the Philips P3230 I covered in a video before I started tech distractions. While benchmarks are a good reference point, an even better one is real world gaming. So let's check out how this build goes with some DOS games.
So that's the 486SLC from Cyrix and Texas Instruments. A CPU with an interesting backstory. Did you ever have one of these SLC chips back in the day? Or maybe the DX-based DLC one? If you did, I'd love to hear about your experiences and memories below. While it represented a bargain in some respects, the 486SLC created some confusion for customers who might have thought they were getting a comparable product to something like the 486SX, when in reality, it was a feature-enhanced 386SX that would have only kept pace with the 486SX under certain circumstances. Of course, the flip side to this is we had more competition and options in the market. This would lead on in the 486 and Socket 7 era, where we saw a variety of manufacturers spring up with interesting architectures and interesting offers for the low-end and mid-range market. 30 plus years later, I look at this platform with mixed feelings. As someone who lived with a 286 at the time, when it was well past its prime, I reckon I would have jumped at the chance if my folks brought home one of these little guys on the cheap. But hindsight is a wonderful thing. And Doom coming out shortly after, I'm glad we waited a year and a bit and I ended up with a DX266 as a family computer. Anyway, that about wraps up this one. If you're still here, thanks for hanging around till the end. I've got a few more 386 era projects on the backlog and I look forward to bringing those to you as soon as possible. But until then, take care and bye for now.